Hello everyone, my name is Rochelle Innocent and I'm the founder and CEO of Project Purpose. Welcome to our channel. Our community is focused on fostering the intellectual and character development in children. We do this through our parent-child workshops that are focused on four themes, autonomy, self-efficacy, compassion, and self-concept in order to cultivate grit, perseverance, and resilience in each child. And we are so thrilled to be offering one of the first of its kind, digital, virtual, and continuous learning environment enabling parents and children to connect from all around the world. At Project Purpose, our overarching mandate is to renew and rebuild family, community, and relationships. Our different social media platforms provide us with an opportunity to have discussions and to create space on all topics that relate to family, community, and relationships with ourselves as well as with others, with a primary focus on mental health and education. More precisely, the ways that the institutions of mental health and education play a role and have played a role in our societies at large. These discussions and debates provide us with an opportunity to think critically about what needs to change within these structures for us to live up to our bold slogan, support, protect, and empower each child through youth-focused development, better known as leadership in juvenescence. We recognize that in valuing our children's leadership potential, this also translates as recreating and co-creating environments, both socially and politically, that will enable our children to thrive. Now, for those of you who are particularly keen on the topic, we also write thought pieces every other Sunday and we actually just dropped the thought piece this past Sunday, so be sure to meander over to the website and check out our online content. Now, if it is the case that you are looking for a listening alternative, well, we're available on 12 different podcast platforms for your listening leisure and we've provided you with access to the links in the description down below. Now, as is the convention, be sure to subscribe, hit that post notification bell so that you are aware of every time we post. And of course, if you like these conversations and you want to keep them going, like, comment, and share this segment. Let's get into it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our channel where we have conversations on mental health, mental wellness, and education on a week by week basis. And today, our topic of discussion is mental wellness. And on the topic of mental wellness this week, I'm here to give you a survival guide to the smear campaign. We're here to talk about the smear campaign, and this is something that is going to inevitably happen to you if you are making waves and changes, if you're catching people attention. Unfortunately, we can't decide if we're getting good attention or bad attention or if the attention is going to garnish positive feedback or negative feedback. But typically, when it is the case that you are the topic of discussion, it is the fertile ground for a smear campaign. So given that I've survived more smear campaigns than I feel inclined to admit to, <laughs> I have survived quite a few smear campaigns in my life because of my personality. I definitely make waves and that can garnish a of course, a little bit of hate and a little bit of jealousy. And frankly speaking, at the very root of a smear campaign is jealousy, envy, and resentment, right? If people don't like that the attention is being pulled from them, or if because you are there, they're not getting the kind of attention they're looking for, then that then becomes a problem, which means you become the problem for them. So I am someone who has a fairly cavalier attitude towards smear campaigns now, but it's definitely taken a, a lot of growth and learning and experiences with smear campaigns to learn to brush it off. But of course, easier said than done, and I'm not here to discount the painful experience that a smear campaign can bring, the trauma that it often brings when you're blindsided by how quickly people can turn. So I'm here to give you the survival guide to your smear campaign. And this is gonna be a two-part series, and the first part is just setting the tone as to what typically will take place in a smear campaign. I've seen them done in many different ways, and they follow the same schema. They have a framework about them. So I'm gonna give you my sense of the framework and and you can see that associates or relates back to the situation that you yourself are dealing with. And I'm also gonna give you a couple of fundamentals. So fundamentals by way of beliefs, by way of attitudes and positions to take internally to give yourself the opportunity to ground yourself in the face of the 
character assault that you're going through. And that's essentially what a smear campaign is. It's an assault on your character. And so I think that these are never fun. They're never good, but they teach us a lot about human nature. And they also teach us a lot about life, about what's within our realm of control and what isn't, and also cause and effect. So cause and effect, the do's and don'ts when it is the case that you are in the heart of a smear campaign will be our part two of this two part series. But this part of just setting the tone, giving you the context. And if you are like, hey, bells are ringing, like lights are going off. This is something that I've been through. Then, hey, you have <laughs> been subjected to your first smear campaign it means you're doing something right when you're the topic of discussion but here's how to make sure that you come out relatively unscathed. So first I want to talk about the general framework of a smear campaign and a lot of the time smear campaigns go based off of traditional norms. Traditional norms by way of things that people typically relate their own sense of self-worth and sense of value towards. So in a society typically we value things like social status which can be informed by income, which can be informed by you know what your parents do or don't, what neighborhoods you live in. So I think that a very rudimentary, very elementary style of attack focuses on this. So if people in that setting are very tied to valuing themselves by way of income, by way of family status, by way of like neighborhoods that they live in, then this mayor campaign is going to catch their attention because they see themselves as worthy in relation to these things. So they're going to question your worthiness in relation to these things. So a couple of things to know, this is a really basic attack I have learned in my life. This is like a fairly unsophisticated attack, but it quickly allows you to weed out the people who are in your life opportunistically. If someone immediately shifts and changes their attitudes towards you because of this new information about your income, your family status, what neighborhood you live in, then those are not the kind of people you want to keep either way. So while smear campaigns can be very painful because you're hearing other people's version of events that pertain to you and your life and that put to question areas where you might personally derive value, it also gives you an opportunity to extricate your sense of value from these areas. You are more than your income, than your family background, than the neighborhood you live in. I mean, if someone scale of deciding whether or not they want to be friends with you, then I'm assuming that you have enough depth that that is just not the kind of evaluation that would even qualify them as being your friend. And we don't know that the different things that people are leveraging to decide of whether or not we qualify or are eligible for friendship. But I'm saying like, if someone does one of these very unsophisticated smear campaigns and people shift and change towards you because now they have new, though false information about, or even it could be true, but it's just being painted in a very ugly way and it's making you feel unworthy and it's causing you to be a repellent to the people that typically you would surround yourself by, then take it as a gift because those people were never for you to begin with. But that is the first attack. And again, this is the most unsophisticated, most elementary attack to attack your income and to be like, oh, well, she's not one of us because you know she comes from this family or has this income or you know, <laughs> lives in this neighborhood. All of those things are so superficial, they're so shallow that if people reorganize themselves as a byproduct of that, take it as a blessing. You don't want those people in your life to begin with, but it also shows you the depth of character of the people who are throwing mud at you within this frame of reference. And always remember, like if this is hurting you, if it's making you feel insecure, if it's really having an impact on your self-esteem, you are more than your circumstance. Circumstances are subject to change. So anyone who feels superior to others because of income, family, because of the neighborhoods they live in, all of that is subject to change. All of that could easily be taken away in a heartbeat. The pandemic has shown us that a lot of the things that we tie ourselves to are temporal. So if someone ties their sense of self-worth to something so temporal, Temporal, then imagine how shaky and how vulnerable their sense of self-worth is. They're constantly trying to protect it with these external things that are eventually going to fade and are not going to have the same value to others as it does to them. And so they're grasping at straws in the air, to be honest. But that is the first attack that you can foresee yourself going through. Now the second attack is a little bit more sophisticated but still baseline in my opinion and this is an attack on your sexual orientation, your sexuality, or your health. So this is where people start to make derogatory comments, make 
rumors, gossip about your health, whether that's your mental health, whether that's your physical health, whether that's your spiritual health, or about your sexual orientation. And I think that we're becoming much more cognizant of the fact that people's sexual orientation is really no one else's business and nothing for people to comment on, but everyone feels that they have something to input about one's mental, physical, spiritual health. Now these can be harder to think about objectively because they're very personal attacks and a lot of people can take something you say, something you do, and really twist it to make it seem as though their claims or the rumors that they're spreading about your mental, physical, or spiritual health are true. So it's really hard not to rise up to your defense and not to be angry and try to justify yourself. But the one thing that you don't want to do during a smear campaign is give it energy by justifying what is being said or justifying yourself against what is being said. Deny it and move on with your life. But like these are honestly like the baseline tiers of tearing someone down for whatever reason. And I'm gonna go into the reasons that I personally feel why someone would initiate a smear campaign. A lot of it to do is fear, right? People smear when they fear, when they fear you, when they see you as a threat. And the easiest thing that they can do when they have nothing objective or specific that they can use to throw at you is to cause people to question elements about you that they really have no idea on, right? So if someone's not really thinking about it, they're neutral, but now it's been brought to their attention, then it's something that they can take a position on, right? But if they're taking a position on it without first contacting you, discussing it with you, if they've decided based on this new information that, oh, it must be true, and they become a bandwagoner. And I find a lot of people are just bandwagoners. They want something to believe in. And if that's your fragile mental health, then they're gonna believe in that. Or if that's your physical health, not being well, then they're gonna believe in that. Or if that's, you know, anything to do with your sexual orientation, a lot of us have dealt with these, what I call middle tier smear campaigns. So middle tier smear campaigns are about your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health, or your sexual orientation. And it also gives you an opportunity to recognize that who you are is beyond what people think and, and see of you. And it is a hard lesson to learn, but it is a lesson that we learn when we are subjected to these kinds of smear campaigns where people are gossiping and rumors are being spread about your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, or about your sexual orientation. And I have to tell you, I've had to deal with rumors on all of these fronts. And you just learn that you cannot control the narrative beyond you. If someone doesn't want to speak to you, to get a sense as to whether or not there's truth in that narrative, if someone feels eager to believe that narrative, then it tells you about how to frame or value those connections in and of themselves. I think that the one true silver lining in a smear campaign is one, it teaches you to value yourself beyond the words being spoken of you. The words I speak of myself, what I know to be true of myself, and I am the most aligned to my truth, is it supersedes what anyone else can say or do. And I think that sometimes what people say or do moves you from one community to another. It gives you a sense as to, well, I've outgrown this community, or I should have never allowed myself to be attached to this community if these people who I thought I was connected to are so ready to demonize me or to see me within these lenses, despite what they do know about me that should trump or should at least cause them to question the things being said. But if you find that the people around you are quick to believe and quick to assume a position against you when these kinds of rumors go around, again, consider it a blessing. It tells you that these people do not belong in your life in the next stage or phase that you go through, whether that's within that same environment or as you grow and shift course and find yourself in a new environment. These ones are a, a lot more, for me personally, they're a lot more jarring at first if you had had your first smear campaign that attacks your physical, mental, or spiritual health or attacks your sexual orientation. These ones are really, really a bitter pill to swallow because they are more intrinsically how we align and self-identify in healthy ways. How we see ourselves mentally, how we see ourselves physically by way of our mental and physical health is something that really ties to our sense of identity, right? So if someone questions that, they're really attacking us at our core. They're attacking our sense, like different areas that really closely align to our sense of identity. But it also is a reminder to you to not label yourself. You know, whatever it is you're going through, whatever challenges you might be having in 
your mental health, don't define yourself by those challenges. Mental health, like physical health, can be point in time. Like, just like you can have a cold, you can have moments where you're feeling a little bit more fragile, you're going through a rough time, but if someone decides to bank on that and really start this negative and ugly rumor about how your mental health is spiraling, like that person, you don't need them in your life and the people who jump on that bay wagon, you don't need those people in your life either. And by way of sexual orientation, I am not someone who is shy about my sexual orientation, but also I am not someone who feels inclined to engage in conversations about my sexual orientation. I'm not defined by it. It is simply what it is in, in my point of view and I understand that we're making strides by allowing people the freedom and not even everywhere but in some places for some people their sexual orientation is a bigger deal to them because it's something that brought about shame or that they had to hide or that you know was taboo in some certain way shape or form. So I understand how someone being malicious and building a smear campaign around their sexual orientation would be very painful if they themselves haven't found alignment or haven't been able to find their voice in communicating their sexual orientation. That's like a big deal for them. For me, I think I've had to learn to diminish the way that I value sexual orientation because A, I think that it is too easily weaponized against us when we hold it too close to heart. My sexual orientation has to do with me and the person that I feel inclined to be in a romantic relationship with. No one else has a right to comment on it or to have an opinion on it. If you think on it, I mean, save it for yourself in your diary. I don't care about what your opinions are by way of my sexual orientation. I mean, I, there's nothing more to be said around that, but that is what I call a middle tier smear campaign. And it's just important to recognize that the lessons that come out of these campaigns are they teach you the amount of emotional attachment that you have to these aspects of your identity or these aspects of life. And I think that when it comes to income, family status, when it comes to the neighborhoods you live in, I mean, those, I call them baseline, very rudimentary, unsophisticated smear campaigns because only very shallow and superficial people will fall away as a result of that campaign. Those are people that you don't want in your life anyway, but I think that these middle tier campaigns that attack your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, that attack your sexual orientation, they're closer to home. So when people are deciding how they feel about it, it's much more personal, it feels much more personal, but it also is a position that they take based on their rooted beliefs and their rooted values around these specific things. And so you still, though it will be more painful, more difficult, want to be at peace with who removes themselves and creates distance because of the gossip being spread around this, because of the slander, because you still don't want those people part of your life. If those people can't stand the heat, when the heat gets a little bit hotter and with these kinds of rumors they do, because at the end of the day, the reason why I don't feel inclined to justify myself, like I will deny what is not true 100%, but I'm not gonna go into a monologue. Like I'm not going to go into like a huge tirade about why this is or isn't true because people believe what they want to believe regardless of what you say for or against the belief in question. So I will deny it and if you choose to believe it, I am at peace with how that changes the dynamic and changes the relationship and I move on and move forward because it teaches me that I am beyond the thoughts and beliefs that people have about me. I cannot allow myself to be defined by external narratives when those narratives are so impressionable by a smear campaign. So that's food for thought for you. And now the third, and this is what I consider to be the most vicious type of smear campaign, and you really have to have a tough skin to deal with it for, for me personally, is the smear campaigns against your intelligence and your competence. Now, when someone goes after your intellect, this for me is hard for it to not be personal. So I'm not gonna say to create objectivity around it. I think that it is personal, it's a personal attack, but it is also a signal of someone really flailing. Like if someone was not able to successfully tear you down because they tore into your income, your family status, or the neighborhoods you live in. If they were not able to tear you down because they talk ill about your mental, physical, emotional health, or because they talked ill about your sexual orientation, or they made you seem to be, you know, very sexually liberal in a way that is not, I don't know, acceptable in the communities or environments that you're in. If those things didn't work, then their last grab 
is attacking your intelligence and your competency. And the reason why this is very pointed is because whether someone likes you or they don't like you, your competence is going to shift and change the way that they can work with you or the way that they can sort of build bridges with you and build synergies with you. Like, so if people are like, well, wait, if she's incompetent, even if I think she's cool and even if I like her, well, I wouldn't want her tackling things that I need a competent person tackling. And so it goes, right? And so, but I've learned that to treat all of these smear campaigns. And so a smear campaign against your competence is more involved. There are more people involved. It takes a lot of support to prove someone to be incompetent, but still you need to mind yourself. You defend yourself by denying the things that are being said and by showing up your best self the way you typically do. I mean, show up in excellence. Don't let these campaigns get to your core. Don't let them break your confidence or let them shift the way you see yourself, which is I think really the point, how people navigate and orient themselves in the face of these smear campaigns tells you about the environments you're in. It tells you if you want to stay in that environment or not. It gives you a sense of fit because I don't want to fit anywhere that feels very comfortable to very easily assume I'm incompetent because a few hands were raised to that effect. I think that that is ridiculous, right? So I personally am much more tied to my sense of competence and my sense of intelligence. I define a lot of my own personal value by my intelligence and my confidence, but I realize that that doesn't need to extend it externally. And that's because of smear campaigns around my intellect. I am comfortable with someone assuming that I'm incompetent, knowing that I'm not, knowing that at some point it will show. I think my competence shows in the work that I do and the conversations that I have and in the level of quality that I put into everything that I put my energy into. So because of this, because I know that I show up always wanting to do the best work, to learn where it is that I fail, to do better, to evolve, to expand, to enhance. If people take those moments where I'm learning and where I'm failing as part of my learning to say, hey, she's completely incompetent, and the people rally behind that and bandwag it behind that, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> It is what it is, I will deny it, but at the end of the day, like I'm not gonna justify myself and justify my competence and my intellect to people who are comfortable tearing it down with very little information or tearing it down without first getting a personal sense of who I am or getting a personal sense of the quality of my work, of the efforts that I put into getting things done and to getting things done well, of the amount of dedication that I put to my own growth and learning when it is that I do fail and I do believe in failing. I think failing is the best way to learn and to grow. If you're seeing me failing and you're assuming, oh, well, she's incompetent, she just failed, uh, that's because you don't give yourself permission to grow. And I'm on the growth trajectory. I have a growth mindset. So if my failure is any sort of validation to you that I'm incompetent, despite some of the areas that have shown and proven my competence, then I don't know what to do and I don't care to engage, to be quite fair with you. But I think when I talk about the survival guide and build out the framework to what a smear campaign looks like, I'm building it out so that you see that they have have the same nature, right? They have the same course and it's always done by someone who sees you as, as a threat. And that also is the root of this conversation. Your survival guide to dealing with a smear campaign is one, recognize that you are always where you were supposed to be in every situation that you're in, dealing with the people that you're dealing with. So I am someone who fundamentally believes at my core that I am where I am supposed to be in every space and place that I'm in. And I like to practice being present and to be still to get a sense of the lessons that I'm supposed to extract, especially during challenging and difficult situations where I'm dealing with really complicated interpersonal dynamics. I think I grow a lot during those very complex interpersonal dynamics. I learn a lot about myself. I learn a lot about the people around me. And I also recognize my locus of control in those situations where I feel I'm spiraling out of control because the narrative around me is shifting or is misaligned with how I see myself. And it's like, what do I do in those circumstances and those situations? And the truth is you stay still you observe and you extract the information to determine how you move forward. And that doesn't seem like control, but it is a lot of control to do that because sometimes it is the situation, the momentum of a smear campaign that shows you people's true colors and shows you why people are in your life and for what reasons. And that is a gift. And you're not going to get that without a little rumor mongering, without a little gossip and seeing who picks one side over the other, who rises to your defense in those types of situation. So because of that, I have learned with time and experience to see the smear campaign as an opportunity of clarity, of truth, 
and a realignment. And it is a bitter, bitter pill to swallow sometimes because there are certain people you thought would go the mile with you and then the smear campaign comes and you realize actually not the case. But still, I believe in aligning myself to the truth that my environment is teaching me. I believe that I will always push towards the outcomes that I want, but I will accept the outcomes that take place. If I know that I showed up every day pushing towards the outcome that I was looking for, aligning my behavior to the outcomes that I thought were in my best interest, and a completely different outcome played out, I am at peace with that because I showed up for myself in that situation. And I think when it comes to the smear campaign, the first lesson is recognizing that your value or your sense of self-worth cannot be external to you. Otherwise, it's easily, easily vulnerable to attack and you, you will pick up the broken pieces of yourself up every time the smear campaign comes along. So you need to learn to build your sense of self-worth internally and not allow external opinion to validate or to refute your sense of self-worth. It needs to really be about the essence of who you are as a person and everything else is superfluous beyond what you personally see of it. So for me, like how I see myself circumstantially, whether I'm going through a really abundant season in my life or I'm going through a period where things aren't so abundant, like how I see myself, I recognize that my value is beyond my circumstance and I don't want to be around people who value me based on circumstance because those people for me are energy vampires and they're opportunistic. When it comes to rumors about my mental, physical, spiritual health, about my sexual orientation, I mean these took me much longer I have to say in my life to learn to cultivate a dual perspective on it. How I see myself is the only opinion that matters when it comes to my mental, physical, emotional health and my sexual orientation. I have learned with time and experience that though I may be horrified, completely disgusted, completely affronted by some of the things that people can say and assume about these areas of my life, it further confirmed that the only opinion, the only voice that matters when it comes to my mental physical and spiritual health and my sexual orientation is mine and I think we need to have open conversations about this because many of us take a long time to even get a sense of comfort about our sexual orientation and about our mental health and about our physical health like we don't even know how we feel about it and that makes us vulnerable to assume the positions that other people feel about it I have learned to stand strong in my sense of my own mental physical spiritual health and my sexual orientation and how other people see it is really of no consequence. I don't care about other people's opinions on these fronts. I care about my opinion on these fronts. And I value my mental, physical, and emotional health. I value, you know, how I see myself as a growing, evolving a sexual being. And I really don't have room for input that is external to my own. I will inform you about these things. It does not go the other way around. And I think too many of us value expert opinion about ourselves when those people only have a fraction of the information available that informs our mental, physical, emotional health, that informs our growing understanding of who we are as sexual entities, right? And I think especially being a woman, being highly sexualized, like everything that I do, externally speaking, is sexualized. But I know that a lot of the things that I do, I'm not thinking about myself in a sexual way. So why am I gonna allow an overly sensitive culture around sexuality tell me who I am as a sexual being? And I think that sexuality in and of itself has so many dimensions to it and we only look at it from like this one vantage point and I think that that is ridiculous and I would prefer to shut out the noise that is the external opinions of my sexuality and give myself the space to discover what that looks like internally. And again, the last straw, when people go after your intelligence and your competence and they try to tear you down in that respect, it further reaffirms to you, it proves to you how much of a threat you are, whether you're trying to be a threat or not. And it shows you that this person is grasping at straws, they are desperate and they see their own incompetence in relation to you. And I have to put it that way, it's very harsh words, but someone who goes after your competence is someone projecting their insecurity of their own competence. And the worst thing that I can do is allow their attack to make me question my competence when they clearly see how competent I am and are trying to show other people differently. So these are hard lessons. This is me trying to build you a framework of what a smear campaign looks like, how it's going to translate, and the specific areas of attack that are cyclical. I mean, anytime I've had a smear campaign, I now dub them, oh, this is a low tier campaign. They're going after my income, my family, or the neighborhood that I live in. Or this is a middle tier campaign. They're going after my mental, physical, spiritual health. They're going after my sexual orientation. Ooh, oh yeah, let's take this ride again. Or lastly, my intellect or my competence. I think all of these types of smear campaigns shift and change the people 
that you keep around you before and after these campaigns, but they also reinforce to you what should be important to you by way of what informs your sense of identity and what shouldn't. And in all cases, what shouldn't be important to you are the opinions that other people have when those opinions are flaky and they are so quick to change in a heartbeat, to be honest. So I was hoping to give you that feedback, that insight today. I was hoping to share that wisdom with you and hopefully it helps you as you stay strong, as you anchor yourself in the wave, the tidal wave of that smear campaign. And my second video is gonna be about do's and don'ts. So different guidelines on how to engage and how to position yourself so that you're always true to yourself and aligned to yourself during the smear campaign. And then things definitely not to do because you're playing into some of the narrative that I think is just a waste of time and energy overall. So rise above it, learn from it, and see the truth for what it is and align yourself accordingly, essentially. And again, more on that in video number two this week. In any case, that was all for today, but definitely not it. Stay tuned for more. But before letting you go, I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that we will be going live at least twice a month, every month for the foreseeable future on our Facebook page. So definitely be sure to tune in. Now these events are paid events. And now if you do see yourself participating in our community, engaging in our game changer community on an ongoing basis, and I do suggest that you take a look at our package plans. Yeah, so we do offer package plans that give you unlimited access to our live events, more to come on our 2023 calendar calendar as well as access to webinars and workshops largely focused on self-mastery over and above those live events. So definitely be sure to stay tuned in. If you are concerned about pricing, please don't be. We've incorporated a new payment solution after pay that gives you the opportunity to make payments in four installments over a period of six weeks. And yeah, we're still growing. We're still on the road to 1K. So definitely be sure to follow us, subscribe on all of our platforms. And we look forward to chatting with all of you very soon. We'll talk to you later.